General's Office. Attorney General Kilmartin tasked my unit to come and speak to municipalities about the issues we've seen in medical marijuana cultivation since the program's inception and some of the insights we've seen um, from our sister western states in a new legalized market. And we want to share those with you and also share with you options that other municipalities within the state have done to kind of give the municipality some control over these cultivations. Um, I would say two things as I start. Number one, the Attorney General has always been a supporter of the medical marijuana program. We are concerned about the cultivations that are ensuing. And number two, uh, this is a policy presentation, not legal advice. Since Norman went through uh, the different cardholder functions of the program, I'm going to skip forward through that real quick um, so we can get further into the PowerPoint. But I would just say the current landscape, as you know, is we have a robust medical program, but we are also a decriminalized state, so anyone who has an ounce or less in their possession is subject to a $150 fine that goes to the Rhode Island Traffic Tribunal. So small amounts of marijuana is allowed under the law, even if you're not a medical marijuana card holder. So these are the unintended consequences of a medical marijuana cultivation. These are some pictures from cultivations that we've gotten through our law enforcement investigation. This is a pretty high level cultivation. This is what Norman was talking about. This is a commercial grade oven to make a marijuana concentrate. I don't know if um, the council knows what marijuana concentrate is. It's the new marijuana where you use a substance to literally rip the THC off the dried and fusible plant. It gives you a very high level marijuana, 85 to 95% THC where our usable is about 15 to 20%, and you can use it in different forms. We'll get to that a little later, but this is what the new marijuana looks like. So in the 10, 11 years now since the medical marijuana program, we've seen public safety and public welfare issues coming out of the road, and I would uh, commend CBR for making great regulations and stricter regulations into place, but we still have a vast market that's not subject to those strict regulations. And Having to grow is a very complex process. And as we've heard, they're only subject to inspections in limited circumstances, being the highly regulated cultivator, the limited check of a non-residential co-op, your personal grows generally are not being inspected by a city or town or the state. And here's some of the hazards we've seen. And it's really about the electricity. You're bringing enormous loads of electricity into this, whether it's grow lamps, air vents, hydration, and temperature control. And we've seen in some circumstances that growers will actually adapt their electrical systems to meet their grow needs. And that is both a public welfare and public safety issue. And I think one of the things that the chief will tell you is in a law enforcement world, one of the first things we look at in building probable cause is how much electricity that site is bringing in, because it's a clear indicator. Here's some pesticides we found at the grow, as you've heard. Uh, CBR has put into place certain uh, pesticide regulations for the cultivators, but these are for, this was a, for pre-cultivators, but those regulations, I'm not sure, will apply to personal grow. Here's an overloaded electric, electrical system. Here's electrical cords off the ground plug. This is a really important slide that I want to show you. Please note the front of the room in the power strip with all the cords coming into those two right here. That's the grow room in the back with all the power strips. And no one's inspecting that. My clicker gets impatient sometimes. Here's an overloaded uh, fence system. Here's another picture of, this is a water hydration system and out to the right. That is a PVC pipe going to a national grid metal gas line. <coughs> here's, some pictures, here's some pictures of a fire, and I think it's really important to point out, when we talk about marijuana, there's a lot of different things. Are you a medical cultivation? Are you a black market cultivator? Are you legal? Are you not legal? 
In the words of medical marijuana, this is a legal grow. This is a person that was underneath their uh, medical marijuana plant limits, so they were legal. This started from electrical cords. That's the best to grow beforehand, that's to grow after. Total law. <laughs> Um, please note the oil tank in the right hand corner. This was this was heavy smoke damage. They caught it early, but this was before be, because of a dehumidifier overrunning. This is how we make butane hash oil. This is a non-commercial grade oven, and that's the shatter butane hash oil solid that she was making. We know of four cultivation fires in the state. We think that is pretty underreported. And we know of four BHO explosions. One resulted in death and serious bodily injury. I will note that under the Uniform Controlled Substance Act, ma manufacturing with these materials is considered illegal manufacturing under the law. Up until Article 14 passed, patients and caregivers were protected with their card. That was changed in Article 14, so we do have stricter laws when it comes to making these substances now. And then we have environmental factors. These are some numbers out of Colorado. They say that an indoor grow with four plants has the equivalent of running 29 additional refrigerators in your home. So if you're a patient with 12 plants, that's upwards of having 60 refrigerators in your home. And in Denver, they said that half of their annual growth of power usage was due to indoor cultivation. And then we have public welfare issues. And this is really the hydration that it takes for your seeds and your seedlings and your plants to go. Here's some pictures from Denver. Please note the mold on the sides of the wall here. And this was actually exceeded the exterior of the home. And here's some more pictures of some uh, mold issues and death in the seedling grow. A bigger hydration system. And a moldy marijuana. So we also have public safety issues because where there's drugs, there's fighting. We know that. There's a lot of cash, there's a lot of marijuana there, and they're being targeted through B&Es and armed robberies. We know of Here's some firearms that we found in our uh, law enforcement investigation. We have two reported homicides, two reported self-defense killings, and three suicides. And the B&Es, they're happening day and night. Everyone in the neighborhood knows where the grows are, or they see the evidence that a cultivation is taking place in their target. So and next is the bad actors, and Norman spoke a little bit about this. There are people in the program that are taking advantage of for, for their financial gain. And it's because the statute sets the people up to fail. And I'm going to explain that. So a pound, a plant can produce as little as one ounce, depending on how good a grower, the size of your grow lamp, to as much as two pounds. So if I'm a patient, I can have 12 mature plants. Let's say I harvest all at once. Average, I'm bringing in one pound of plant that's 12 pounds. I'm only allowed to have 2.5 useful ounces under statute. So where is that marijuana going? DB, uh, the governor's office and the General Assembly in Article 14 did do a great thing of trying to commercialize this market for cultivators. However, the caregiver and patient home growers are still there. So our question is, now that they're not selling it to the compassion centers, where's it going? We think it's going on our streets. So our, we don't think that putting a legal market on top of this metal, medical market will help anyone or the situation. Which brings us to legalization of marijuana that you know that we're going to be speaking about this year and have for the last several years. And we just have questions with this. Why are we doing this as a state? Why are we going to legalize marijuana? To provide for medical usage? We've already done that. To allow for small possessions of amounts of marijuana, we've already done that too. To keep people out of the ACI for marijuana, two, uh, December 31st, 2015, a year ago, we had eight people at the ACI in marijuana. Five serving, three um, 
detained for trial. And that wasn't just for possession, that was for every criminal offense, marijuana related, possession with intent to deliver, uh, delivery, et cetera. So this is a pretty complex decision we're about to make. And not by vote, vote referendum, we're going to make this decision. But we haven't studied it at all. So here's things we do know from our western states. Uh, Rhode Island use, we're fifth in the country for 12 to 17 usage. Um, for Middletown, your 12th graders 30 day use rate is 23.58% for um, senior usage in Middletown. The good news about that is that usage has actually went down from last year. The bad news is that your seniors are at 23.58%. We are fourth in the country, 18 to 25 for usage, and our schools are eighth for marijuana use in the high school. We know that one in six teenagers will become addicted to marijuana as compared to one in 11. And we have the modern marijuana that we spoke about. One, our youth will is going up from 4% in the 80s to 15 to 20% THC and now. And we know that the increased marijuana has different side effects in its users. Here's some pictures of edibles. <coughs> concentrate that we spoke about. That's what you make when you pull that THC off, whether in an oil form or in a shatter solid form. And that's what the that's where our kids are using now. They're putting in a vape pen, those little e-cigarette pens. It's odorless. You can't smell that it's marijuana. <coughs> Some more edible pictures. These are more medicinal products in nature. And we think from the western states that the increased THC potency in the edibles and the concentrates is why they're seeing an increase in poison center calls and ER visits. Here's our numbers from Colorado. In uh, 2013, they had about 14,000 marijuana-related ER visits. The first year of legalization, it went up 4,000, just about. Uh, 16 uh, children brought to Children's Hospital of Colorado in 2015. ER, uh, Poison Control Center, calls it went up in Washington State. It increased 67% after legalization. And under 20 calls increased 8% since 2012. And we come back to cultivation. As you know, Massachusetts has a six plant per person uh, under their referendum allowable. Ours would be one. But crime has not decreased in Denver. Crime has not decreased in Colorado, and we still have a black market. You hear proponents say, we're going to take the marijuana out of drug dealers' hands. No, because in Colorado, 44% of sales are to out-of-state people. In the mountain towns, 90% are. It's estimated that 60% of Colorado is legally purchased either stops nationally or postal service um, raids of marijuana being trafficked out of Colorado. And this is where their black market is. The medical, um, illegal operations and the medical collectives out in Denver. And you can see why. Cartel weed is about $300 a pound now. Denver weed is about $2,000. <coughs> if you bring Denver weed to the 95 corridor, it's $5,500 a pound. This is about money. And like Norman said, here's a Craigslist dad. That's happening in Colorado as well. Here's a drug dealer saying that legalization has helped uh, marijuana, uh, Denver, Colorado's black market, and uh, Colorado Springs police saying they've seen uh, expanded black market as inevitable. So one interesting thing to note is now that the car no one wants the cartels to leave, they're not going to stop making money. They're uh, trafficking into our country of heroin and methamphetamine has dramatically increased since 2009. We have DUID, driving while drug issues. Uh, I, I like this. We've seen the 67% increase in operators and fatals tested for marijuana positive since 2013. Denver police saw a 106% increase in DUID from 2013 to 2014. Washington uh, increased 122% from 2010 to 2014 of operators and fatal accidents with active THC in their blood. Spokane, 
54% of their DUI fees involved youth. And here's the money. We're doing, everyone wants to talk about money. This is why we're doing this, right? The tax revenue from marijuana was 0.5% of Colorado's general fund in, the, in 2000, FY 2016. And here's the complicated chart of how we spend it in Colorado. And I would note these two dates. This is the municipal share. It's a 15% tax or a 10% tax. And this is what they use for schools, which is one of the reasons the referendum passed. There's a 15% excise. The first 40 million go to building school. The next 40 goes to um, public education. They were very close to hitting those numbers, the first triangle, at the time they produced this slide. We do know that their DVR out in Colorado started with 15 FTEs. They're now at 70 FTEs. And you hear that we're going to have law enforcement do their job more. This is Denver's numbers for law enforcement, how much they spent on marijuana. And of note, the Denver Crime Lab, before legalization, brought in about 500 pounds of marijuana. Two years after legalization, they brought in almost 4,800 pounds. That's how much of a great black market in law enforcement is still being used. This is litigation, and I point this out to municipalities so we can think about it. Here's all the lawsuits that people have faced in the western states. Pesticide use, Denver had a long lawsuit on that. Public consumption, what does public mean? Can you have marijuana bars or clubs or lounges? What's the nuis nuisance order? Can you pursue it under your public nuisance ordinance? Advertising regulations, banking, and employment. And employment is something that we need to consider because what happens to our workforce? Denver is having to go out of state to get people to pass pre-employment uh, drug tests. Here's the status of on-the-job uh, marijuana use, Colorado and Washington at 20 and 23 percent. We cannot discriminate against a medical marijuana card holder in the state for their status as one. You can for uh, using on-the-job. The Colorado Supreme Court has upheld that as correct, but the marijuana industry has vowed to make that their number one priority, that you cannot discriminate based on marijuana use. In fact, there was a bill in the General Assembly in Rhode Island last year on that issue. And like alcohol, people like to say it's much like alcohol. We took in $16 billion in revenue in 2012 and spent out 249 in Society of the Box. And we know we are very lacking of beds in treatment facilities now and prevention. I would just note that uh, treatment admissions are going up. And in the first nine months of 2015, marijuana treatment admissions accounted for 70% of youth treatment admissions in Washington State. And that's an opiate crisis. So what would our neighborhoods look like? These numbers will be a little bit skewed for Rhode Island, but just to give you what Colorado looks like, they have 424 retail stores, 516 medical marijuana stores, and 942 pharmacies. So the reason we're here tonight is if we are going to bring a legal market on top of our medical market, what can you do as a municipality? We think that you should be able to say no, or at the very least have a voice. In Colorado, 75% of municipalities either opted out of retail marijuana or put a moratorium in effect. In other words, 68% of Colorado municipalities opted out of retail marijuana. Five counties in Washington state have done the same thing. We have provided ordinances to you that other cities and towns across the state have done for you to look at for both retail and medical marijuana. We have provided an Excel spreadsheet of every category of that you should think about in doing ordinances and examples of that in your packets. We've also um, given you resolutions as a council if you want to oppose legalization in our state. The thing I would tell you is that the House version of the legalization bill was filed uh, last Thursday. And one of the main provisions in it says that a town cannot on itself ban a retail license category 
unless they take each license category to referendum and the majority of the voters choose to ban it. If that does not happen or the voters do not choose to ban it, then you would be limited in your regulatory authority to time, place, and manner. That would take a significant amount of power away from this council, and we just want to point that out to you so you know it going into the General Assembly session. And again, so you can have a voice in the conversation because you know your police department knows, your fire department knows that you're dealing with this issue and you should have the tools you need to deal with it appropriately, especially in the areas that are not heavily ready, uh, regulated by the state. And I, I know I'm over my limit. Oh, not bad. So, not bad. Okay, go on. Um, but I'm available for any questions, and I've been speaking to your solicitor, um, and your chief, I know them very well, so we're always available for, you know, any questions you have. First, I'm the law of revenue. I've obviously been totally opposed to any legalization of it. I always have been. Um, and well documented, by the way. Um, I think when we start to set policy based on revenue, we're making a big mistake. That's number one. So it's not all about dollars. So, that said, A lot of experience with this. There was the drug recognition state coordinator. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's a program that's been around, been around since the early 1990s. Trained police officers on how to detect persons under the influence of drugs other than alcohol and traffic. Conservatively speaking, I've seen hundreds of people under the influence. I've done evaluations of people. Just about every drug you can think of. Some of the most impaired individuals I ever saw, not just in the state of Rhode Island, but in New York, and Arizona, and South Carolina, and other places, were people under the influence of THC. The other thing that you don't realize is that these people don't just use marijuana. Poly drug use is rampant in this country. Poly drug use is people who are the under, under the influence of. Not one drug, not two drugs, sometimes more than that. That complicates the job of your law enforcement. It makes their job that much more difficult. And it makes our roads and our highway, our safety, that much more at risk. When you talk about fatality statistics, dead men tell no lies. That's the bottom line. That's what it's about. Rhode Island has had one of the highest rates of highway fatalities in the state of Rhode Island, in the country at one point or another, and impaired driving played a big part in that. I know. I've seen the statistics. I've seen the results. I've seen the victims. And I'm talking about not just the dead people, but the victims' families who have to stand in front of the legislature each and every single year and talk about impaired driving. And thankfully, we've got new beats on headways over here because there were times when you couldn't even get into the, into the House Judiciary Committee to testify because I've been there. So I can't be more passionate about this. I don't want to see it happen. I don't know where it's going to go. I mean, maybe. Well, maybe you've got the temperature of the legislature at this point, because I know, Julie, you're up there all the time. Um, you know, I mean, are these bills going to come out of committee? Do you think? Councilman, I really, I don't have any idea. I don't think I could actually even judge. I, I, what I do know is that I know a lot of the elected officials in the General Assembly are trying to learn as much as they can. That's, that's what I do know. And I don't want people to be fooled by the, by the money. I mean, you know, there's certainly a lot of money in this stuff. There's no doubt about it. But you know, when there's a lot of money, when you're talking about these type of things, you're going to pay the piper somewhere along the line. Whether it's addiction, and whether it's impaired driving, and the fatalities, and the things that happen with that, um, we have to pay for that. We have to, we have to pay to train our law enforcement officers to, to do their job. Uh, you know, it taxes our courts. 
taxes our systems. You know, so I, I can't say it strongly enough, and I sound like a broken record. I apologize for that, but I, I've talked from experience. I've seen what it does to the people, to their families, to the communities. Um, it's, it's not what it's cracked up to be. This is not medical marijuana. I'm not speaking against medical marijuana. I'm speaking about legalization. I don't want pot shops popping up at every street corner. They have more pot shops in Colorado than they do pharmacies. There's something wrong with that picture. Joey, nice presentation. Thank you for coming down. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, more toward the medical marijuana piece, I guess. In your early part of your presentation, you clearly depicted uh, a lot of electrical issues and fire, um, public safety issues. Um, has the state, speaking about just medical marijuana, because I don't really know enough about marijuana in general, I think we're all trying to learn these presentations. So, um, what about um, instead of instead of having them, because it draws a lot of electricity based on the lights or the heating system or whatever is used, um, have they ever given consideration to putting into effect people that are legal? There was one slide that somebody was doing it legally, or he was legal at, or she was legal at the time. Some type of instead of taking away from the energy, some type of solar, where that would be required instead of pulling energy away from, you know, whether it's, everybody's going solar now, that's kind of what's going through my mind when you make a presentation, or require them to have ones that do medical generators, where they're using generators to power their operation, and they just happen to use diesel fuel to, to fuel the generator. Just just a thought that was going through through my mind when I, when I That hasn't been considered that I know of. But as I said in the handouts we provided, there's a lot of things for a municipality to think about and requirements for cultivation to under, you know, the Indian monsters that are for zoning the other municipalities. Yeah, no, I was talking more statewide right. from the state. You know, maybe the state should look at that and maybe require some type of alternative energy source, whether it be a generator or um, solar. It's certainly something to look at. Yeah. Uh, my second question is, and maybe this had more to do, but you brought it up again, um, maybe maybe geared more toward Norman, and, 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 and forgive me if I get this wrong, but I was trying to write down as much as I could. In your presentation, you said that um, on average, a plant would produce about one pound. And there are 12, is it 12 plants in bloom, I guess, I don't know. 12, 12, oh, 12 mature, 12 seedlings. 12 mature, 12 seedlings. So, so if one, if, if 12 mature means that 12 are ready to be harvested, I guess, and each one averages a pound, that's 12 pounds, but the state's only allowed, this is all medical, the state's only allowed two, two ounces, I think, Norman, you said of dry, usable? 2.5. 2.5 dry, usable. Pretty simple math that doesn't add up. I mean, why don't you just reduce the amount of plants that are allowed in, in, in bloom or in vegetation or mature? In 2000, you know what I'm saying? Yes, I do. So that doesn't add up if you have 12 plants that can produce a pound. That's 12 pounds, and you're only allowed 2.5. You know what I mean? So in 2013, and it, I might be wrong on this on the year, so forgive me. We did put in legislation doing that. We cut the plants in half and actually doubled the ounces try and get it more on a scale of equity, uh, but that bill is not enacted by the General Assembly. But I would note that um, as of the making of this PowerPoint in the fall, Mayor, uh, Rhode Island was one of us and three other states had the highest plant counts in the country, and about eight states don't even allow for plant positions. Now, so, the delta of that example I gave, Mr. DePalma, we were on the council together, so we would see the delta, the delta, right? So it's just a, just a joke. But anyway, um, would be, I don't know how much they're selling to who. Neither would you, I guess. I guess you wouldn't have enough tax, I would assume, but I think that's probably a good thing. So just a couple observations. But I think solar and some type of generator instead of, or some type of uh, alternative energy source really need to be looked at from a medical standpoint. 